I'm very glad to be talking with Maddie Pennington from the think tank Theos. Hi there, Maddie. Hi there. Um, I wanted to reach out to you because um, I'm involved in a project looking at how designers and design can foster love in a variety of contexts, um, both the personal and shared social, ecological, spiritual ways. Um, and you, um, amongst the other things which you do at Theos, have been involved in well, a number of reports investigating death and dying in the modern world. And, you know, the rituals around death and dying are shifting and changing, disappearing, maybe new ones emerging. Um, so that's just one facet of how an encounter between what designers might bring and this part of life that we all face one way or another. Um, you know, might be fruitful. So hence wanting to talk through some of the ideas from your report um, in in that, in relation to design in particular. Um, but may, could you maybe to start with, could you just sort of paint a bit of a picture? Because um, in a, one of the headlines that I took anyway was that um, traditional religious rituals um, are um, on decline on the decline, maybe quite substantially, um, you know, the kind of parish priest who might have done, I don't know, two or three funerals a month, um, now maybe does one a month or less. Um, and into that space around the process of dying, particularly uh, medical, um, in a way, well, processes, um, maybe even rituals in a funny sort of way, um, have tended to have tended to um come to the fore um a switch you might say from the religious to the medical that was one sort of broad change that i took is that a fair sort of starter for 10 at least yeah absolutely so um theos has been doing a stream of work on death and dying we've, we've done two reports now and, and a third just about to come out um and the, third, the first one really was just looking at general mapping trends um, around the sort of, I suppose, what you might call the death landscape or grief landscape. Um, and absolutely. So one of the things that picked up was that over the course of the 20th century, um, because of good things like in, better healthcare, essentially, and particularly um, reducing infant mortality, um, but also life extending medical treatment as well, that that the treatment of death and dying has moved basically from the community into institutions and um, people are cared for when they are dying largely by professionals rather than their close um, circle. Um, so that's a huge shift. And actually that was picked up in the first report, but the second report was really thinking about, you know, what are the implications of that? What, what, um, what do people really think emotionally about um, their own deaths and the deaths of their loved ones? Um, how do we mark it? How's that changing? The first report also looks at these sort of broad trends, particularly around memorialization, and um, a lot is made of the rise of secular celebrations of life. Um, and as you mentioned, a sort of declining popularity of traditional religious funerals, um, which I think we can put another way, a, a decline in the sort of centuries old ways of ritualizing death so that's a huge change um, but alongside that there's this other change which has come in particularly since the pandemic which is um, the rise of direct cremation which is when there is no ceremony at all or at least there might be a separate ceremony but what people are paying for in the cremation itself is 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 no mourners no ceremony um, it's cheaper than um, burial or, or traditional cremation um, and before the pandemic in 2019, that accounted for three percent of all. Um, I suppose we call them like all funerals or people who died, but three percent of those people um, had direct cremation. Um, now it's it's potentially 18 percent, and that's the figure that's often quoted. Um, and in our report, we asked people whether they wanted a funeral, um, and fewer than half of the people um, said that. Fewer than half of our respondents said that they did. Um, there was also a huge don't know category. So in most of the questions we asked, there's maybe sort of, I don't know, sort of two to five percent don't knows in that one. There's kind of 28 percent. don't know. Like people aren't really sure. And this is partly because direct cremation has been advertised as well. So TV advertising is, is, is a huge part of this picture. So so really, I, that, I hope that you get from that that mm. I suppose two things, really. First of all, our society 
does death badly and it's kept sort of behind closed doors often and the, the ordinary person on the street although most people in fact almost everybody has lost somebody we found um exposure to the actual realities of death is much lower um and secondly that just the way that we mark grief therefore therefore is, is completely changing in ways that we're not necessarily aware of or having a public conversation about so um that's very helpful to get some sense of the scale as well and and so things like direct cremation it's a, it's a very significant part of the landscape now um the, the research was and was focused on the uk um i think wasn't it um is there yeah. some sense that these kind of trends are replicating in other parts of um, the western world yeah i think we sort of i mean I would, yes we did focus on the uk so i can't speak for sort of the whole of the west but we did look a little bit at what was happening in other countries and you you find the same trends really that basically uh, particularly i suppose in response to two things the cost of dying <laughs> which um, we're in a cost of living crisis but the cost of dying is huge um and that um we found responses to that huge cost across western countries um so that's uh, that's a big thing and also this sort of sense of death being medicalized and institutionalized um obviously that's a feature of the modern world um you know ac across the world really um yeah yeah so um as you say it's a complicated thing because the medicalization of dying brings many advantages like easing suffering and extending life but there's a loss there as well um and I wonder whether you could say a little bit more about that and particularly perhaps um, a loss in the sense of how the medicalization of, di of dying, let's think about dying and then sort of thinking about after death um, later. But in terms of dying, um, it brings in a very particular spirit and attitude towards dying, um, as I say, for obvious good reasons, but perhaps squeezes out other parts of the dying process both for the person dying and for the people around them that um community-based dying um the rituals around dying itself not um after death um might foster um could could you give us some sense of of what is lost in in you know in spite of the gains of the medicalization or the institutionalization of death yeah i mean i think We've heard various um, medics talk about um, this sort of unhealthy sense that, that death itself is a medical failure now, that we that there is a problem that people don't talk about amongst their families, basically how they want to die, and they don't necessarily um, find themselves prepared for a moment when it becomes clear that their loved one is going to die and whether there needs to be a shift in treatment then from focusing on, well, like, can we try this other cure, this other treatment, which actually might, in fact, prolong suffering um, towards a shift of thinking about, um, OK, this person is dying, how do we, do we care for them? A palliative care treatment has massively expanded and um, improved over recent decades. So as part of this research, um, Theos's annual lecture was with a palliative care consultant, um, Dr. Catherine Mannix, and she talks about how death has recognisable stages like giving birth that actually obviously not everybody dies an ordinary peaceful death but most people do and actually that you can see that coming and, and if we're aware of those stages we can recognise them we can prepare for them so that's one thing I would say um, that we've lost that um, knowledge I guess of, of, of um, what it looks like for somebody to be dying there's also the emotional side of that, that actually, as fewer of us are looking after our dying loved ones, there's, there's a huge vulnerability and care and, and love um, in looking after somebody in those vulnerable final days or weeks or months. And that that being lost, um, I mean, be careful how I phrase this because I, you know, I don't want to see a return to people dying without medical care any more than anybody else does. So as you say it's it's in the context of huge gains but um i think perhaps as a as a society we we have passed past that responsibility and knowledge over to professionals and perhaps there's a bit of a loss of confidence there 
um, to to be with somebody else, they're very vulnerable. It's sort of actually now they need medical care. Somebody else needs to care for them rather than me. And actually, you know, really throughout most of human history, and I think this probably is true in, in parts of the world with less developed medical care as well, that that, that is a is a responsibility of loved ones. So there's there's it's a privilege to care for somebody in those moments, I suppose, is the is the way to say it. Yeah, it, uh, it can be um, in a very profound part of life being with someone who, well, maybe in the first steps knows they're going to die because they have some sort of condition that will lead in that direction. Um, but then with dying itself, I mean, a couple of experiences um, that I've fairly recently had. One is a general sense, knowing a couple of chaplains who work in hospices and them saying that whilst in hospices, palliative care excellence is, is, is tremendous, um, and the spread of that um, resource um, is very much to be welcomed. Um, the medicalization can still be quite powerful, even though in that context there are chaplains, people with spiritual nous, um, the, the facilities to bring families in, um, help people stay in the home. Um, you know, that practical stuff can be done very well, but, but still what it means... Um, psychologically, um, spiritually, um, is is not always um, straightforward to explore. Um, but that um, contrasts with um, an astonishing um, experience that I had, which was a very close friend of our family's um, who died. She had a death doula. Um, people may be familiar with the notion of a birth doula, who's a woman that accompanies the woman through the pregnancy and then the birth and, and afterwards. Um, and offers support that is expert in the sense that they've been through that process with other people before, but it's not medical expertise. Um, and this friend of ours, um, she had a death doula. And um, the, the, the moment you realised, um, actually, how important that had been um, in really staying with all the aspects of dying, um, the fear and the concern, but also the sense of value. And um, and, and this person actually wasn't religious and they were secular, but still um, being present to this most tremendous part of life was at the funeral itself, um, because part of um, what had happened with the death doula was to really think about the funeral service and just a few actions, um, you know, some well-chosen music and so on um, brought, um, that person's death um, so present to us, and um, it was it was one of the few funerals I've been to um, where people didn't actually want to leave the church afterwards because you felt you were in the presence of something so tremendous. And as I say, this person wasn't actually even religious, but still um, the rituals and um, the thought that had gone in because of the attention paid to the dying process. Um, at a spiritual, psychological, as well as practical level, um, you know, was really uh, invaluable, actually, really tremendous. Um, so, so that's a bit of a, a personal confession, but um, I guess that, um, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the complete opposite of, um, you know, just having bodies taken to a crematorium and then the ashes delivered to the home without any ritual at all. Yeah, I think that what, I mean, what those examples bring home to me and I think that really shines through in what Kathleen Mannix talks about as well is just what a skill it is to accompany somebody through that and we in in all sorts of ways in society we we undervalue those kinds of skills um I mean knowing what to say to somebody who's dying or indeed knowing what to say to somebody who's just lost somebody very close to them um and that's the sort of sharp edge of a much broader set of skills around just caring for people. That's something else that Theos is doing work on at the moment is care work. And we're also looking at motherhood and what it means to basically, um, you know, be those people in society who who can't pass on the need, <laughs> you know, that actually that that deepest need and most difficult parts of life. But could also be really transcendent parts of life um 
you know, what, what does it mean to like hold that, I suppose, and, and rituals um, that are now becoming less popular, obviously, are sort of centuries tested ways of holding that. Um, I mean, I, one book that I've been reading recently is um, Faith, Hope and Carnage by the great Nick Cave and <laughs> Shauna Hagen. And he talks about how, I mean, he very sadly lost um, his teenage son in an accident um, and lots of the book is talking about that and actually he lost a second son after the book was published which um, is just obviously really awful but he talks about his grief as life-changing and um, he sort of acknowledges that this will be hard for people who are grieving to hear but for him it's been both obviously the, the worst thing that's happened to him but also this kind of transcendent reckoning with the ultimate reality of things and and realization of human vulnerability and that you that we mustn't hold the world in disdain that we that we must love each other and you know just how precious human life is and, and all of those things that are sort of bubbling around this sort of huge universal human experience really i mean it, it just is the depths are endless we could talk all day um never mind your podcast about about mm -hmm. the sort of shades of meaning around that yeah, and no, I've read um, uh, Nick Cave's book as well, and it, um, it's it's very very remarkable. Um, and one of the things that um, comes across is that um, through this um, terrible tragedy, which he describes, is you know was unbearable, um, but at the same time, he maybe because he perhaps lives an atypical sort of way of life anyway was able to um, find ways of holding close together um, the living and the dead, those who have died and those who are still living, and um, you know, create um, a, or discover, I shouldn't say create really, but discover just a very different sense of life as a result. Um, and I guess, you know, the fear is that, um, in a world that's so shaped by, um, you know, getting things done, progress, um, and um, the sense that the goal really is to extend life as much as possible until it's just not possible anymore, and then sort of move on as quickly as possible. Um, you know, Nick Cave's book shows that um, something um, very painful and that's absolutely not minimized at all, um, but also transformative um, gets lost. Um, and so therefore the, the, the rituals, the understanding that can help people stay with the pain and the suffering, um, both those who are dying and those around them, um, you know, because there's the, there's the chance of holding out for something which can transcend all that, can be known and only really known fully through the experience itself. Um, you know, this is something which is at the heart of many religious traditions, certainly within Christianity, um, the idea of dying being the pathway to another life um, and meant not just in the sense of um, the end of mortal life, but the way that life itself is full of little moments of death and letting go and passage and passing and so on um uh but yeah it it, it does I, sp let me, I mean in in the report there's a lot of there's quite a lot of discussion about talking about death and making wills and things these kind of practical things you can do um there's uh, you mentioned death cafes as well um which are gatherings where people are guided through talking about death um and you know the, the design of the environment um the kind of hospitality um that's put together for that um are are they the key ways that um things might be designed to help us engage with dying um in a fuller way once again i think it's interesting i'm gonna as you're speaking i was thinking gosh from a design point of view the the trick is i suppose to recognize that whatever you're designing people are not only going to be experiencing that with one emotion but you might actually be trying to hold more than one emotion at the same time obviously that's the challenge um i think that the death cafes in fact we had a um round table about the research just yesterday and, and someone mentioned that they 
had run death cafes that were I think her phrase was they were largely governed by laughter <laughs> and um it's interesting how people powerful emotions kind of can come together right and and particularly around death because there's no more powerful emotion than than the loss of people who obviously we don't want to lose and the loss of loved ones but that is really the other side to love and it is a bit of a cliche to say it um i think queen elizabeth said uh, <laughs> grief is the price we pay for love or something like that um mm. but it's very true that those two things need both acknowledgement um and it's ultimately about connection isn't it um, on both sides that um, theologically christianity has this rich language which i think has often been misinterpreted and seen as quite harsh of of death as separation but i think one of the things we said it is actually that that really honors people's intuitions about grief which is that it's it's a feeling of separation when when what is intensely desired is connection um so from a whether it's designing spaces with people to come together or whatever it is then i think it's that connection that allows space and voice for those powerful emotions to come at once mm. i think something else that can um get forgotten is that um rituals and sometimes that's almost too fancy a word to use but just you know gathering together with others um going for a walk and a talk um things like that um they're actually ways of knowing you you can realize things by going through a process a ritual um that you just couldn't really have known otherwise um you know some i think nowadays we can think of rituals as kind of fancy optional extras for those who are that way inclined you know they have a certain aesthetic sensibility or maybe certain religious convictions that want the respect of the ritual but actually you know we learn through rituals um because they take us through something, through an experience um, in a way that is careful and, and so cares for us, um, but enables us to absorb, process, digest. You know, these might be the words which are used. Um, it, it, I, I mean, I, relatedly, I think that the growing interest in pilgrimage, going for intentional walks, starting in one place with a clear destination in mind and holding something um, whilst you're going on the walk, people are surprised how powerful that sort of thing is. Um, and yeah. conversely, you know, how much is therefore lost um, when they do disappear? Yes, I think that in so many, I mean, both of those things are traditionally associated with religion and sort of the phrase throwing the baby out of the bathwater kind of, uh, I mean, I wouldn't think that actually religious faith is at all um just bathwater but but it's that that we have assumed that because we don't as a society um that fewer and fewer of us are religious that that that's the only thing going on in those sort of ancient practices really and actually um the the wisdom that is held in those things has built up over centuries. I mean, I, it's funny. I'm um, I'm being a celebrant for a friend's wedding this year. I've been asked to be a celebrant, and so, so one of the things I've been thinking of, and they're not religious, is we've been sort of trying to look through traditional wedding ceremonies and think, well, wh why have these things been designed in this way? What's actually, you know, what's the purpose of having that bit, and what's lost if we don't have that bit, and how can we interpret that? To, to have the same thing and, and ultimately not very well qualified for that task because I'm not a, a liturgist and I haven't been alive for thousands of years and it's a it's a it's an an awesome task really isn't it but that's what as a society really we're we're having to do is um or at least that we are doing I'm not sure we do have to do really I mean I think churches would be delighted to <laughs> to welcome people into their rituals but um I mean, but yeah. but maybe looking at something with fresh eyes actually surfaces um, things with a kind of clarity. Uh, I mean, you know, rituals. I think when they're rites of passage, like marriage, like dying, the funerals, um, they're very good ways of helping us in an embodied way into a different stage of life. Um, you know, yeah. so they they can be very loaded. You know, 
like in a traditional wedding, who gives this woman to be married um, can feel very, very gendered. But at the same time, it is maybe like you were suggesting um, with, with dying, clearly stating in some way that something has changed now. Um, and when it's done in a ritual context, um, that can be very helpful, maybe not in the moment, but when people look back and they feel, I'm glad that we did that change well, um, it can be very important, in fact. Are you, what, what, what sort of things are you discovering looking at weddings? <laughs> Well, it's, well, it's funny that I've been, the big thing I've been wondering about is that, so I'm a Quaker, so we had a very unusual wedding, although also traditional in my own tradition, in that it was, um, so in a Quaker wedding, and in that, in fact, in a Quaker funeral, this is almost the same format, because it's all silent worship, so um, for the benefit of your listeners, um, Quakers worship in silence, and the idea is that you speak if you're, if you're moved, and um, it's the, it's sort of, um, extreme version of the priesthood of all believers that we don't there is no separate person leading it it's it's um the group coming together which creates that worship um and so in a wedding it's completely silent and then the couple decides to stand up and just says their very simple vows and sits back down again and then they're married um so people can then stand up and say very nice things and and it can become um obviously sort of personalized through that later contribution but um i've been thinking about the vows because that's actually the only bit of a traditional what what i think most people would think of as a traditional um wedding that that we had and i suppose we wouldn't call them vows maybe we call them promises but it's um there's a question around sort of do, do the do those promises capture everything that people want to say to their partners in the service so it's quite common now for people to write their own vows or do a sort of address to each other. Um, and I was interested that some of the most famous bits of the Anglican liturgy um, are actually associated with the giving of the rings and, and they're not the vows. So the sort of everything I have, I give to you, everything I am, I share with you, you know, that that's not actually the the bit that we might associate as, oh, they've, they've said their vows, now they're married. So it, it, in that sense, there are sort of, those are two quite different examples of traditional rituals, but there are different stages and there are subtle things going on. I mean, as a Quaker, I would absolutely say there's more going on in the silence than just those vows. I mean, it sounds funny when you think it probably is like, well, what, what's just happened? Is that it? But actually, if you're used to that kind of worship, then there's definitely a pilgrimage going on through that silence. Um, it's absolutely a ritual. Um and little things like the couple come in together rather than separately. That's an, also a testimony to the equality. Um, so that all of these little signals in, in any ritual mean something, don't they? And I think um, just returning to death and dying, obviously, um, funeral services are absolutely no different from that. Um, I think I would say I personally, but Theos in general as well, feel, you know, worried about what happens to a society's grief if there is not some way publicly to mark it and we know that intuitively we don't really like the idea of being told we can't have that this is the other element is the is the choice who decides whether there's a funeral or not because obviously in covid lots of people would have wanted a funeral would have wanted more people at their funeral and that felt really inhumane to be take to have that taken away um but now many people are making that choice and it, it might be right for the people who are making that choice. But of course, funerals are even a bit different from weddings in them. You can basically just go to a funeral. It's not really just invitation only, is it? So um, or often mm, not. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, just on yeah. your comment on, on silence. I, I, I'm, silence is a very subtle thing to hold. And the design of a room, the awareness of the people in the silence, um, very palpably affects the quality of the silence and as you say the experience that unfolds through the silence um so yeah yeah, yeah you don't need me yeah. today, but I, I can appreciate that um you know even in a seemingly minimalist context like that there's a hell of a lot um that can be thought about and um brought to bear on yeah. the quality of, of of that period of time yeah um, well, it's a question. For, I mean, just on that very briefly, it's, I mean, it's a question for the designers thinking about what what, what do people want to happen in this space. I and mean, one of the things that um, I have been told before growing up as a Quaker is, you know, it's not meditation, it's worship. 
And actually, I mean, full disclosure, lots of Quakers would probably disagree with that, actually, and say, no, I am meditating. But there is, for example, a difference between trying to completely empty your mind and in, and be silent and be very disciplined in the way you're holding your body and aware of each bit of your body in turn and settling down. But that's quite a different process from overspilling worship in the silence. So, you know, what do we want our spaces to hold? Even if people aren't speaking, there might be some quite different things going on there. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, to, to have an understanding of how um, it, it can have a very different intention um, is, is, is important. Mm. Um, and again, yes. what you know, emotional that, journey do we want people to go on? I suppose is the question. Yeah, yeah. And in a culture that's become rather unskilled with silence, that, that well, they, they're putting it positively, can be a real discovery. Actually, um, a sense of something that is tremendous um, that, that that can be undergone. Um, just just thinking a little bit more about um, um, funerals, and particularly um, say um, the new rituals which might be emerging as well um uh you know kind of wayside memorials you see them every so often these sometimes get picked up in the media um that the the people want to leave markers of respect um indicating what's being lost perhaps personalizing it um with objects that belonged to the individual concerned um you, you see these things every so often, you know, maybe by roadsides where there's been a, um, a tragic accident. Um, but is, is that is that a new form? Um, is it is it taking shape? Has it even been studied? Or, or what can we learn from the new rituals as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't. Um, I suppose the short answer is we haven't researched roadside memorials or that directly, but I think that that is my understanding is that that is quite recent. I mean, recent in terms of the last few decades, not the last few years, um, it, it, that it's um, a new form of expression. One thing that our research did pick up was that personalisation. And so we asked people um, basically what kind of elements of these, a traditional funeral or non-traditional funeral, would you like at your funeral? So they could choose sort of stories and tributes, a talk by a religious leader, a talk by a secular celebrant, prayers, hymns, popular songs, you know, all that kind of thing. And um, the top answers were stories and tributes and, you know, those things which express something of the person. And then we also had a specific list, which was um, largely inspired by the co-op funeral care chart, which is, there is such a thing. And it's the sort of most popular chosen um, songs at a funeral. And we also put Psalm 23, Lord is my shepherd, um, and the Lord's prayer in there, because in our first report, we had heard that even these secular celebrants were saying, you know, probably half of the funerals I take, somebody asks for the Lord's Prayer or Psalm 23. So we wanted to know, um, basically, do people really want those things at their funeral? If they're thinking about their own funeral, and obviously very few people do actually plan their own funeral. Um, but much more popular than any of those popular popular choices was none of these or my favourite song. <laughs> so again, people just have this sense that, you know, is is less in to have these shared touch points and more about how it reflects the person. That said, after my favourite song, more popular than any of the popular songs what were Psalm 23 and the Lord's Prayer. So it's quite interesting that... Um, what we're thinking a funeral will do. I think that's another recent trend is that it it should express the person rather than I suppose the more traditional view might be that, you know, this is actually a mass and primarily we're here for worship. We're sort of c commending this soul to God or, you know, however it's, however mm -hmm. it's phrased. So obviously theology of funerals differs between traditions. But... Yeah. I mean, just on that last point and maybe beginning to come to a close for now, um, Although we're living in a secular world, um, and, and that, that's very self-evident, and so religious forms be can become, certainly in the UK, um, a rather marginal interest. Um, that's not to say that people don't have all sorts of beliefs about the afterlife, and indeed about the journey that they may go on into the afterlife. That, my sense anyway, is that those 
intuitions, those hopes, um, even those experiences, because sometimes people have near-death experiences um, and they feel they have seen something at least of what might happen after they physically die. You know, that might still be quite a widespread interest, concern, um, something to factor in. Um, and so a traditional ritual that, you know, where the priest might put his hand on the coffin and say, you know, be on your way, Christian soul, um, that might feel um, not quite right for lots of people now. But nonetheless, the, the, the impetus behind that, that somehow the ritual helps the individual who's died on their way. Um, you know, sometimes people feel that um, ghosts might be people who have died, have become attached to a place because they didn't really know quite how to move on um, or their death sort of took them by surprise, even if they knew they were dying um, because it was just so unfamiliar, so shocking in that sense. Um, so I guess we should, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a religious person, you know, you are... Um, to um, but um, how rituals can help us into um, the next life even if one is very unclear quite what that is going to entail it's worth I think keeping a sense of that when we're thinking about the rituals of dying too and not just because you might be a person with a explicit faith but because a lot of people still have intuitions or maybe even experiences um, that lead them to presume that that is going to be a part of dying as well. Yeah, I mean, we so Theos has done various reports, most recent of which was called um, "The Rise of the Nuns," I think, or just the Nuns, the Nuns anyway. But um, but it looks at different types of the people who take non-religious on a on a survey, um, no religion, um, and huge portions of those people still do have spiritual beliefs, um, including beliefs in the afterlife. So we talked about being, there being spiritual nuns. Um, tolerant nons and campaigning nons so actually the kind of um militantly atheist no religious is actually not the whole population that <laughs> that that doesn't profess a form of religion i think there's also something there the kind of interplay between whatever you believe about the afterlife that we all have that sense of um i want the funeral or if not a funeral i want the general arrangements the, the burial or the cremation or whatever it is to be what they would have wanted and to honour them um, in some way. So that itself, there is clearly that intuition that it's not that they're dead and it doesn't matter anymore. Like, you know, the relationship continues after death. You know, that's the most important bit of grief anyway, and that people are not just grieving thinking, oh, what's going to help me come to terms with this, although that's incredibly important. But, it, but there is that... Um, posture and directedness towards the person who's died still even when they've died so although maybe fewer and fewer people think that that's about sending their soul on the way <laughs> um that is itself within a broader landscape of people having this intuition that actually we still do owe something to our dead and we want to honor them and the relationship and that that's fundamentally a kind of significant part of loving somebody is is that last act of care that you can do for them yeah and in a place like south london where i am um where people often are living simultaneously different cultural traditions um that that quite often comes up actually after um death where there may be traditions associated with gathering say 30 days after someone's died or 60 days and and then anniversaries too remembering all that can be you know, really crucial um, for the people who are grieving um, and also quite an education to the wider society that um, anniversaries, um, you know, grieving goes on for years. Um, and again, it's a rite of passage for those who carry on living as much as for the person who's actually died. It is a phase change in the way mm -hmm. that we experience life. Um, so, so yes. yeah. Quite a lot of um... So I was say, well, a lot of the people we've spoken to about the research, particularly in sort of end of life professionals, have described the funeral as the beginning of the grief journey much more than the end. It's that it's moving to a new phase, as you say, rather than it being right, that's done and <laughs> we move on. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's quite a lot of resources, um, you know, in a mixed culture 
um, like ours that you can look at and, um, you know, get a sense of how people um, have a kind of wisdom in their practices that you might want to pick up on and, and have a think about as well. Maddie, thanks so much. Um, any other, you know, key things that you feel, particularly with this design focus that we haven't quite touched on? Um, or have we opened at least up the subject in a way that feels, yeah. One final thing I would say is that, um, so the report that's coming out next month is looking at how technology intersects with grief and um, the rise of things like AI powered grief counselors and that's sort of, at the, or, you know, we already have sort of Facebook page memorials, that's sort of the sort of current situation, but moving towards um, digital avatars based on the data of the deceased, right through to sort of transhumanist ideas of mind uploading. And I, I think um, one thing that's really come out of that for us is sort of thinking about, well, you know, essentially what is a person and what is a relationship and that, that there's this move towards digitization, which may be helpful in some ways, but could be unhelpful or even downright deceptive and dangerous at the, at the far end. Um, but that regardless of that direction of travel technologically, we are bodies, we are embodied and that actually it is our bodies through which we generally show love to each other in, in terms of, I don't just mean sexual love, I just mean like showing up. <laughs> um, so um, I think that's probably something that will increasingly become important to think about is that interplay between virtual and embodied connection. Yeah, and just to say, I'm um, actually I um I I noticed that you're that you've got that coming up, and we're, we're speaking at the beginning of 2024. But I'm going to speak to your colleague Nathan actually about about that um in a in a week or two um because um it is it's fascinating because it's an area of such speedy change, but also because as you're saying there, it it, it highlights elements that are really crucial to we humans, um and uh, so is you know, both sort of fascinating as well as a kind of new opportunity or certainly something to be to be thought through. Um, so look, thanks very much mm -hmm. indeed. Really appreciate your time. Um, people can find out about these reports and so on on the Theos website. That's a good place to go, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So theosthinktank.co.uk and then you'll Do find them a, there. Have a look there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. My pleasure.